Cool, let's kick off, shall we? So first of all, happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining the first episode of Mina FinTech Voices, uh, where today we'll be talking about the power of progressive, reg power of progressive regulation. Uh, I'm really excited about this first session. Uh, maybe just to give you a bit of background. So uh, Mina FinTech Voices is a series of virtual events and the objective is really to bring together all the leaders across the FinTech world uh, from every market from um, uh, um, a UAE to Saudi, Egypt, Pakistan, all across the MENA region. And we really want to focus on what's happening in the fintech industry, not only here, but all across the globe. Uh, and, and really, the, uh, what, what, what we really hope to get out of this is to bring everyone in the audience who's watching now, who may be watching later, a lot of insights and experiences so that we can collectively grow fintech here in the Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan. Um, I'll start off by quickly introducing myself. So uh, my name is Mo Youssef. I am the regional manager here at Checkout.com. For those of you who don't know Checkout, we are a cloud-based global payments provider. We, we actually help a lot of brands such as Kareem, uh, Delivery Hero, uh, and many others um, uh, accept uh, digital payments for e-commerce transactions and uh, empowering them while giving them tailored solutions to really drive more value and effectively offer a much better customer experience. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited about the panelists uh, that we have today. We've, uh, we've, you know, uh, we really have the privilege of having people from all across the, um, all across the, the um, 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 a part of uh, FinTech here uh, with, with us. Uh, so I'll, I'll maybe start off by just getting uh, the uh, four panelists to talk a little bit about themselves, tell us uh, the companies you're working for and the countries that you're in. So maybe let's first start with um, uh, Namir from uh, MFTA. Thank you, Mo. I was on mute. So thank you for the, for the introduction and uh, thank you for having us all over here. Hi, everyone. This is Damir Khan with you. I'm the chairman of the MENA Fintech Association, working very closely with the regulators, with multiple fintechs, and, uh, of course, with the larger ecosystem. And I look forward to this uh, interesting conversation that I'll be having with our colleagues over here from the fintech world. Thank you. Thank you, Damir. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Uh, Georgina, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm calling in from Egypt. Uh, I am the founder of Zivni. Uh, we're a payment solution for freelancers who work remotely uh, and need to accept payments from all over the world. I'm really excited to be joining this conversation. Great, thanks Regina and thanks for joining. Uh, ben? Hi, I'm Ben Ruffles. I'm Senior Public Affairs Manager at, at Checkout.com. Um, I've been with the business for coming on 10 months, but I've worked in um, the public affairs industry and government relations industry for about 20 years. At Checkout, I look after our government relations and industry relations. I'm, I'm based in London, but work very closely with, with Mo and, uh, and Namir through the MFTA on um, Middle East focused, uh, North Africa and Pakistan focused policy issues. So great to be here. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Great to have you here. And last but not least, Majid. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I always love chatting with smart people like my colleagues here. And uh, uh, my name is Majid, um, the co-founder and CEO of Tamara. I buy now, pay later, and, and Mina, based in Riyadh. Great. Thanks, Majid. So we're going to basically structure this in three parts. Uh, we'll first start off by talking about some of the more... Uh, um, uh, global trends and news uh, that we've seen coming out. Then we have some specific questions for our four uh, panelists here. Uh, and then finally, we will open up to questions from any of the uh, participants who may be watching this uh, live. So, so I think just quickly diving into the first section, um, the first thing I want to, to kind of talk about was the fact that the, in the UK, the, uh, um, the um, a regulator there came out and they basically warned fintechs to not compare themselves to bank, actually specifically telling fintechs to actually avoid using the word bank if they actually were not a regulated financial um, uh, entity that was actually protecting the customer's funds. So uh, this made quite a big splash if you are any way related uh, to fintech, um, especially because in um, uh, 
Europe, which is one of the uh, hotbeds of fintech uh, activity, this was seen as a significant step uh, forward by the regulator to actually put in a lot more controls and really uh, enact a lot of consumer protection. So I'd just like to get uh, your thoughts um, on this and in no specific you know, um, order whatsoever. Um, if anybody wants to go first, we would you know, love to hear what you you know think about this? Does this make sense? Is this something that the regulators here should actually consider? What are you know your thoughts on this? Namir, uh, maybe you want to kick us yeah, off. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mo. So, so basically, it's a very interesting development that has kicked off in time as well in the U.S. Now, the city in. It, so I'll have to basically look into the into the into the customer's interest as well on how the consumer is being protected and what role the regulator is basically playing, right? So there needs to be some progressive regulation, which I would say that comes in from the central banks who do keep an eye on how the entire this this entire buzzing space is being controlled. Now, going out there and calling yourself a bank when you're not a licensed or full-blown bank is not really uh, you know, something that I would permit because then if you're looking into a banking operations largely, then there's so many regulations that you basically fall under. So at this point of time, I mean, considering how, because you know, if you're looking into the MENA region, this region is kind of developing and this region is progressing. Now, what has been happening in the UK or what has been happening in the US is what our regulators have been seeing over here as well. There has been an incident lately where a bank or, or a platform has gone out and called it, call itself a bank without having the banking license and the regulator, you know, rightly so identified that piece. So, because you see, you don't want to be in a position where you want to misguide the customers or the customers think that, okay, if I'm actually putting in my funds into this, into this specific banking platform, right, or this specific payments uh, platform, then I'm actually dealing with the bank. So fundamentally, uh, I think it's a responsibility of the fintechs, whether they're basically taking a BIN sponsorship from a bank or whether they are basically partnering with any other banking, uh, you know, entity, the large banking entity, they need to be clearly uh, following the DNA of what, of what a fintech is all about, of being transparently, not just offering the pricing, but also communicating how they are basically operating the, uh, the entire procedure. So if they are working with a BIN, uh, working with the bank, clearly identify that on your card as well that you're issuing to the users. Because I believe that really creates, I mean, that is the DNA of a fintech. Ease, access, convenience, transparency, right? Where you're communicating transparently who you are, what you are, and what you're doing with the funds. So in my perspective, I would be in favor of such regulations coming in because uh, yes, we are advocating change. We are advocate, we are disrupting the overall element of how financial services are basically taking place in the region. But we need to take that uh, uh, in place while we are, you know, within the purview of the regulations and the customer's wider, wider interest. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Samir. So actually, I'm, I'm gonna take what you said and let's go to um, uh, Ben. And I'm gonna ask a slightly different question, right? So what, you know, uh, Namir is talking about is really around consumer, consumer protection and uh, you know kind of supporting the position of the um, um, of the you know um, of the um, guys there uh, do you think that consumers in the end who really go to a fintech for the purpose of a customer experience or better you know value do you think that they really care whether or not they're getting financial services from a tech company or from a bank or from uh, a fintech uh, so I uh, great question I th I mean I think one of the reasons that the FCA has intervened in this debate in the way that it has actually stepping back is that, you know, they've seen the COVID crisis, the pandemic, the lockdown um, accelerate the move away from cash. And they've, you know, they've seen more and more non-native people move in the direction of, you know, digitally pro provided financial services. And I think part of the reason that they've um, made made the intervention in, intervention that they have in relation to EMIs and PIs not describing themselves as banks is precisely the point that you um, you were alluding to that consumers um, see the services provided by different institutions quite as quite similar. Um, and yeah. what the regulator I think is concerned about is that the the level of protection and the type of protection that you get as a consumer 
of an EMI provided or a PI provided service is quite different from a bank, particularly in relation to the protection of your money held with that institution. Um, if you've got money held with a bank in the UK, you're protected by the um, financial services compensation scheme up to a limit. Um, the, the arrangements are very different when it comes to EMIs and PIs. So the focus has very, been, very much been on the latter institutions having to communicate to their customers the way in which their funds are safeguarded and the sort of distinction between um, what the protections that apply to, to them as a customer of an EMI and a PI versus the protection that they might get from a bank. So I think that's what's going on here. Got it, got it. So let's just go to our two founders and maybe see if they have a slightly different view. Um, um, uh, Majid, maybe let's just start with you, right? Um, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think that the regulator should, should you know, it's, uh, kind of step in as much as they have here? Or do you think that the regulators should sort of let um, our entrepreneurs and fintechs run and then kind of figure it out uh, later on? I think the word banking is, is just too attractive to a lot of founders who want to use it. But in reality, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. There is a service level that you have to provide and customers will see a lot of added value. There are digital banks that we know of that didn't really make it although they are real digital banks and there are startups yeah. like PayPal, like uh, uh, Square, like uh, you name it, who were never a bank, but made it bigger. And, 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 and they are now the, the leaders in FinTech. So the issue I think uh, is with the founders and those who I would call FinTech people, um, which I uh, respect, but I think they are approaching it in the wrong way. You should find a solution uh, for a problem rather than being just interested in building a bank. Most people that I know of in Fentech, just they, 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 that's the end goal is to be a bank, which is the wrong yeah. thing. You should solve a problem and whether it's a, a bank or X or Y or Z, that's the goal. So I think even for, for, from, from a regulatory perspective, banking is very sensitive. Actually, it's better for yourself to avoid that word. I tell people, I'm not even a financing company. I don't want to be a financing company. Call me a payment company. It's even better because I can <laughs> go I can go way far uh, and further than being a bank. Uh, so it's actually not, not good to be a bank uh, in this era. Avoid it as much as possible. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's fine for the regulator to, because a bank, being a, de a depository institution, is a huge, huge, huge operation. And you yes. don't want to be that, and you cannot be that by I mean, with day one. You have to have a huge capital, huge amount of expertise in your team to manage that well and get to the end of the tunnel uh, and not collapse and create a catastrophe for your, uh, for your people, for your uh, customers, and so on. So uh, it's better for, the, for, for regulators to, to smash into this. Don't call yourself a bank stick to adding value to your customers. And that's, that's the end goal. Okay, so it seems like three out of four are very, are very supportive of this action. Georgina, we kind of see you shaking your head. So let, let's kind of get your thoughts on this as well. No, I think there's like 100% consensus on this. Um, I actually come from a regulatory background. So, um, you know, I used to advise the G7 and G20 on innovation policy in regards to non-traditional uh, security threats that the digital economy may pose. And I think um, regulators, from a regulator's point of view, your role is to protect the general public, whether that be consumer protection, uh, whether that be protecting national security from uh, the threats that some of uh, you know, new technologies bring, uh, your role is to protect the general public. Um, there should be a barrier to entry for a core banking system in general, uh, you know, you can't just uh, found a company yesterday and come to the central bank tomorrow and ask for a digital banking license. It should not be as simple as that. Core banking and uh, FinTech services are on two completely different levels of um, 
risk first of all and then in terms of like the operation running it's it's a big big difference um i think fintechs that try to position themselves as digital banks too early actually end up hindering um any chance they have of actually ever getting licensed as a digital bank and i think uh the biggest parts here where i think founders have a responsibility to people is transparency in the financial service industry your relationship between the company and your customers is very it's very important that there's integrity that there's transparency that there's accountability and trust and when you're a new player you have to build a relationship of trust because no one knows yeah. who you are right so if you're going in claiming to be something that you're so clearly not okay your credibility is ruined on day one the regulators have no reason to want to to work with you because at the end of the day the regulation um, and innovation relationship is really built on collaboration and trust again so if you're ruining your credibility so early on then it really puts you in in a, at a disadvantage um to to grow and to actually become a digital bank if that's the goal and you know from a business perspective i think uh, majid spoke very well on it but i'm purely speaking from a from a policy perspective um it's just it puts you in a bad position so another one supporting this but it's uh, it's it's really great to see that um I think that the um, uh, FCA is kind of stepping in, and it sounds like everyone here is quite, you know, supportive. Uh, I think similarly here in this part of the world, uh, we actually see here um, uh, central banks is, uh, also starting to make some pretty significant progress. If we kind of zoom in on this part of the world, um, you know, let's start with you. Let's start with you, um, uh, Ben. Um, uh, what do you think uh, are some of the key things that you may be seeing in um, Europe that you know um, are also may be happening here as well, since you've been uh, engaging with various um, uh, central banks here, do you think that the uh, fintech ecosystem here is one that's maybe growing, and that uh, are there specific things that the um, regulators should you know be kind of you know considering based on some of the experience that you had over there in Europe? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the um, I mean, from um, the work that I've been doing with UMO in the region and, um, you, you know, with the MFTA and um, and others, it's clear that the ecosystem is one of the most innovative and exciting in the world. Um, I mean, coming from um, a UK based background, uh, you know, we've had a, a, a fairly thriving or a very thriving fintech ecosystem for some while now. Um, Looking, looking at the kind of experience here and what's driven that from a regulatory perspective and you know, where there might be learnings um, for the region. I think when, when our founder, Guillaume Pouza, um, uh, wanted to set up Checkout.com as an EMI back in 2011, 2012, we had a different regulator here in the UK. We had the Financial Services Authority. Um, one of the reasons we came to the UK was at the time it was really one of the only places to play if you wanted to create a new EMI, which right. we did. Um, since then, though, the FCA um, has been created in place of the FSA. And I think one of the things that's been really important in driving the ecosystem that we've got here is that the FCA had baked into its objectives a duty to promote competition in the interests of consumers. And the FCA has, has sought innovation and driving innovation as a, a means of delivering against that objective. So you've seen some really innovative initiatives to um, move the industry in that direction. The regulatory sandbox, I think, um, you know, we're all familiar with. Um, that was part of a wider project innovate that the FCA, FCA introduced back in 2014. And as, yeah. as well as providing a safe space for, for, for startups to test new propositions, um, they also introduce much more intensive interaction with you know uh, prospective startups um, and that might be anything from you know a quick giving them the capability to get quick views on what certain regulations mean through to quite intensive support in development of business plans and readying themselves for authorization so the 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 regulatory framework was very pro innovation but i think what you see what you see in the uk now is 
um, uh, a, a reaction to other ecosystems really emerging and challenging London's sort of primacy as a fintech centre, including in um, the MENAP region. So the FCA and the UK government as a whole is looking again at the regulatory framework here and how, how it can be updated to provide um, support for fintechs that have launched but are still new um, businesses, uh, rather than just sort of chucking them into a framework that also applies to businesses who've been around for 20 years. So they're introducing something called a regulatory nursery later this year that will provide more interactive, constructive engagement with, with young, innovative businesses to try and keep the ecosystem growing, which I think is a really interesting initiative. And it'll be interesting to see whether that filters across to the MENAT region over time. So we have uh, nurseries and then uh, we also have uh, sandboxes. It sounds like a nice little um, uh, play yard. Indeed. Uh, so, you know, just, just kind of building on that, I think, Ben, first of all, thank you for sharing how that's kind of changed over the course of the last couple of years. I think here uh, in, in the, the MENAP region, we've seen the term sandbox now. I think um, on the American probably correct me, but I think it was 2017, 2018, <clears throat> when we saw that first one. Um, uh, Majid, uh, let's maybe go to you. Um, I think that uh, Tamara, you know, uh, was one of the first to be enrolled in the, in the SAMA sandbox. Um, uh, I think it'd be great to understand how you found the process, the reason for actually going through the sandbox process as opposed to just launching and then asking for forgiveness later. Can you maybe walk us through what that's like, how's your, how's kind of your kind of um, experience been? Do you have any feedback or any uh, advice for um, uh, any of the startups? So um, the experience in general has been quite good. Uh, to be honest, I was surprised given the fact that we have a general um, look into this as it's, as a prohibited area. I don't want to ever get to that line and, 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 and be careful from crossing it. Uh, but uh, what I found is since we heard the, the word sandbox and, and um, you should apply and you get uh, uh, the approval to start working, uh, I was actually, uh, I wasn't from the first cohort, so I was not too excited. I thought it was just, I don't know what it is. I didn't know what, what the sandbox is at that time. And, I, and then when I saw people really going out and then, uh, coming with, with big uh, names in the market like the CCP uh, now in Saudi and, and others, I was shocked by how the regulator is actually trying to help these companies. And, in the, uh, and it's, it's, it's coming with a proactive kind of environment. So I applied uh, and actually was rejected the first time. Uh, not kind of rejected, more like, uh, sorry, you're not in our cohort. We are theme based. But what I was surprised by is, look, I take the risk. I cross the line and I start my business. But then they actually approached us. Not that we applied again. They re-approached us and said, you know what? We want you now in the sandbox. They didn't say stop working. You have to go through the sandbox, wait until the, the next uh, cohort. They said, no, no, no. Okay, we understand. Now you're operating. It's an, uh, a regulatory, uh, a regulated uh, uh, business. So let's uh, start working together. Give us uh, 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 the documents we need and uh, we will enroll you immediately. And exactly that what happened. They uh, enrolled us in a few weeks and they've been very supportive since then. Uh, the issue that is that in this market, in this part of the world, we are in a lagging kind of uh, regulatory environment where we wait for others in the world to kind of regulate, to, to build the benchmark, to enable us to make the right decisions. Uh, um, and that, uh, and, and PNPL is a challenge because BNPL has not been regulated anywhere in the world yet. Yeah. And that is creating a kind of a, a challenge for the sandbox environment as well here in the region, because, okay, we can't even study what's happening in the world. No one has yet regulated this industry. And this is a quite a challenge uh, for them and for us. How can we maneuver? We'll see how it goes. So far, they've been very flexible. Um, I, uh, to be honest, and overall, I tell every entrepreneur is now, it's the right time to build a fintech. Uh, there were never uh, uh, this much of openness in, in building a fintech startup in the region overall, and especially in Saudi, 
where it's from the very top uh, being enabled uh, and, and, and being supported. Uh, we actually had a visit from uh, uh, high level uh, uh, officials to our offices and they were just here to support us, asking us what you guys need. We will, will enable you. We want you to become something big and, 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 and beyond and so on. And that kind of support is unheard of a couple of years ago. Um, it was just too, too good to be true. Uh, so from a regulatory perspective, I, I think Sandbox is, is a good idea and has been working well for us so far. And from an overall support in the ecosystem, it couldn't have been better. Got it, got it. So, and um, uh, Namir, just moving over to you and kind of uh, following that same, you know, trend of thought, um, uh, FCA, you know, has been doing all this stuff, kind of, you know, um, uh, leading, leading the way. And then you've kind of seen them go back even to a younger set of startups and trying to support them. Saudi's doing quite a bit of stuff. And, the, and um, uh, Tamara specifically has been getting, getting a lot of support, but there's still a lot of room for further laws, regulations, policies, frameworks. For you, know, you working across um, Amina, can you maybe tell us about maybe some of the different things that you're seeing? Are you seeing that same friendliness to fintechs? Are there any kind of new regulations that are you know, uh, coming up? What's, what's, and also, what's, you know, what's the view of different regulators when it comes to competition? So I'll start from the last question, which is how do the regulators see each other as competition? So I would call this a very healthy competition, which is good for the region, right? Where, you know, where you have the likes of, uh, you know, Saudi, we have Sama, we have CBUAE, we have Egypt, right? All the regulators right now are looking to pace up their, their, their developments, are looking to pace up new regimes coming in, are, you know, looking to also pace up new fintechs to basically come in and establish themselves, right? Now, I would also at the same time, like, you know, give credit to Sama for being so progressive and fast, right? In terms of how quickly they have been enabling fintechs. They have a 60 day timeline from the date of application to basically enable the fintechs, right? And uh, that 60 day timeline is such that if you don't really qualify for, you know, if you don't really, you know, uh, you know, if, if you're not really, uh, you know, permitted to basically go live, then you, of course, qualify for the sandbox. So don't, they don't really say no to you, but they make sure that they enable you, which is a very positive thing, right? So, and at the same time, you know, the process has been such that they, they ensure that all the right stakeholders are available in those meetings. And I'm sure you've gone through that process as well, right? Where all the relevant stakeholders, the regulators are available in the meeting to ensure that you know, the enablement of the fintech happens quick. Simultaneously, if looking into the CBUAE as well, I mean, how are they looking into this space? Um, CBUAE has been quite progressive as well, because of course we have, um, we have recently had the fintech office that was set up, right? And the fintech yep. office has been working in close collaboration with the, with the larger fintech community over here, right? In the UAE itself as well. And also hearing out from the the internet, from the other uh, fintechs operating in different parts of the region as well, to understand how they have been progressing and what do they need in order to basically enable themselves over here in the country. Uh, simultaneously, um, you know, looking at Egypt. So Egypt is one of those, you know, again those those real live markets where a lot of you know hustle and bustle is also happening. Egypt has been, I think, enabling a lot of fintechs in their sandboxing environment as well. And uh, they have been quite progressive in that space. So if I was to pick up these three different regulators, you know, largely and how active they have been, I wouldn't really say that one has been more active and the other has not been. I think all the markets bring in their own unique propositions. And that is why it is the core interest of all of the, um, you know, all of the fintechs who have, you know, presence in those key, three key markets. Um, how I see the, the 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 sandboxing environment further being enabled and how I see the sandboxing environment further enabling more fintechs is such that, see, right now, Saudi has 30 plus, uh, you know, uh, fintechs that have basically either, you know, successfully graduated or still in process of basically being graduated. Simultaneously, CBUAE has come up with their own core sandboxing regime as well, which enables you know, fintechs to, you know, whether they are in DFSA or whether they are in FSRA to have their presence in that core sandbox as well. So I, I see the, so in terms of the sandboxing environment, I think all the regulators are doing substantially well, one, which is very promising for the region. 
Uh, number two, uh, my my point would be the pace. How quickly are we enabling those fintechs? Pace needs to be up to the you know up to the mark. Um, it's not that we basically get a fintech into the sandboxing environment and the fintech once it's a part of the sandboxing environment stays there for almost a year. I mean, we need to have a quick decision to it, right? Because you see, we, we need to do justice with the entrepreneurs or the founders or who have actually set up those companies, who have invested, who have gotten the capital injected into the company as well. So we need to do justice to them. So we need to be in a position that we, we are, I mean, this is largely in the region that I'm talking about, that there needs to be a decision that needs to be a lot more quicker. So a large organization or a large fintech or a unicorn fintech to a small fintech, there needs to be a time-based approach where we are saying, okay, 60 days or 90 days, you have an answer, yes or a no, not being lingered on for a year or eight months or nine months, right? So that that shouldn't that shouldn't be the thing that, that needs to happen and uh, more time-based. Uh, in terms of the regulations, Mo, I mean, I've been, been hearing Majid as well and yourself and, uh, you know, others too. In terms of regulations, yes, there have been good regulations coming in. Of course, you have the PSP framework in Sama, and then you also have the uh, SVF, the stored value uh, facility that has been launched by CBUAE too. Uh, we do also sense that these, the, the way they have been designed, um, they actually give a lot of um, access to multiple features uh, for the fintechs to come and establish themselves and then operate too. So I see that these uh, these progressive regulations that are coming in, um, yes, they're taking the time, but as they're coming in, I Mo, can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. We kind of lost you at the end there. Oh, okay. So I was just saying that these progressive regulations just basically are enabling uh, more and more people to basically more and more fintechs to come and establish themselves as well. And simultaneously to ensure that, uh, you know, when we're looking into these, uh, you know, the central banks, they're a lot more, uh, I would say, flexible in approaching and understanding what these fintechs typically want. But yet again, my main focus would be time based. Time is critical and time is essential. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, ben, did you want to say something on this, or should I go to my next question? Let, let's let's okay. keep moving. Yeah, I've said. All right, cool. So, Georgina, we are not keeping you silent uh, intentionally. Uh, I think that your experience with you know a um, CD uh, is super important for this for this um, our conversation as well. Um, I, uh, Egypt itself is a massive market, lots of fintechs. There's a sandbox as well. I last heard that there was 35 digital wallets there, right? So just a huge market, lots of stuff happening. It would be great to learn about uh, your experience, whether you're in the sandbox or whether you're going direct. I think uh, that's also important. Maybe you can share that, maybe you can. So I'll uh, leave it up to you. But if you don't mind just giving us a couple of sound bites. You are mute. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so Egypt is a huge market, as you said, and it's a very interesting opportunity because you have about 60 to 70 percent of the population that's completely unbanked. Um, so you have about 29 banks in Egypt and the majority of people aren't uh, using them. Uh, I think that's when the, the wallet model emerged is when um, entrepreneurs and innovators uh, started experimenting with different methods uh, for financial inclusion um, so that we can digitalize the economy for people that don't have access to the banks. Banks are largely inaccessible uh, to most of the country. Um, and I think the central bank has, you know, I think for, for the last two or three years, especially, uh, been very adamant about working in collaboration with the fintech community. Um, there is a, a couple of sandboxes that have run so far. I have not participated in any of them. Uh, we work directly with our partner bank and uh, that's um, the relationship we currently have. Uh, but, you know, I, I have spoken to entrepreneurs with um, concepts and, and projects that aren't regulated by current policy frameworks and needed uh, very specific, um, you know, uh, policies to govern what they were trying to build. Um, I think 
from, you know, uh, being in, in the other position in the past where I was working on the policy side, I will say that the policy process in general in any country, um, if the government or the, the, the central bank is being uh, progressive in their approach, it's very much a consultative process um, with any stakeholders involved. And I think Egypt has done a really good job at that in that uh, you know, our regulations were completely outdated. And now you have Ripple and blockchain technology being used in Egypt. This is huge, huge progress. And it is a case by case um, situation. You know, I think one entrepreneur will have a very different opinion and say that it's completely backwards. And, uh, you know, they're not there. I think it's about the approach. I think the relationship between the regulator and the innovator needs to be one based on mutual trust and uh, collaboration for it to work. Um, and I think fintechs in Egypt that have approached it in a consultative manner, as opposed to, um, you know, doing whatever they want to do and then begging for forgiveness later um, have had very successful um, experiences. Um, and I definitely think Egypt is one of the, the biggest in the Middle East now that's open for fintech, um, if you go about it the right way. Mo, you're on. Sorry, that was, yeah, that was my turn uh, to be on mute. Uh, yeah, very interesting insight. So if, uh, if I can just ask you um, I, um, a follow-up question to that, right? Um, uh, you know, when, when, when you kind of look at the, the market that you're in and the um, uh, experience that, uh, that you've been through, would you say that uh, navigating the regulators there is something that's been simple? Or as, because you know, you talked a lot about building trust, relationships. Majid actually also talked um, uh, quite a bit about that. Uh, do you find that it's a relatively um, relatively uh, easy and simple process or does it take time to build the right relationships and contacts? I, I don't think it's a simple process navigating that kind of relationship on either side, right? Um, I don't think in terms of like the accessibility of the networks, if that's specifically what you're talking about, I think yep. the sandbox has made it um, accessible for anyone to have a direct relationship with the central bank. And I think, um, you know, it, it's for, for me, it was different where I had a previous relationship because of my background. Uh, but I think the sandbox was specifically set up so that any entrepreneur with the right execution and the right idea and the right framework can come to the central bank and ask to be properly regulated. Um, in terms of the actual navigation of that kind of relationship, no, quite simply, it's, n it's not an easy relationship to navigate. I think as an entrepreneur in fintech, at least for in my experience so far, 50% of my job is navigating that kind of relationship, which is a lot when you're building a company and you need to be running the operation and, and acquiring customers and pleasing your investors. You know, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot of time, but it's, it's so important uh, that that kind of relationship is established and maintained. Uh, it's why big fintechs have entire departments dedicated to it. Um, and I think if you don't foster the right kind of dynamic with the regulator, um, it really can make or break your company. Um, it's not easy to navigate, just building on that, because the, the regulator will always have different interests than you. Their interest is to protect the general public. And that's completely fair game, right? And your yeah. interests are to grow as fast as possible. I think the trick here is for the, in for the innovator to be completely mindful of that and um, be flexible in their approach. So for Zivni in our specific case, and I'll speak transparently on this, you know, we weren't able to do uh, inbound and outbound transactions in the country on an international scale. We can only do inbound. And the decision I came to was there's a very big market of Egyptians that need to be paid from other places in the world. And if I can cater to them and then renegotiate and have to lobby and, and, and kind of build that trust, it's a good starting point to eventually ask for higher limits, to ask for 
uh, inbound and outbound transactions. So, you know, you can't, you, the entrepreneurs that go to the central bank and ask for a digital banking license without taking the steps to get there, that's the problem. From a regulator's perspective, right? Um, I think regulators also have to keep in mind, and this is me being critical and being in that position as well, is that um, traditionally what's always happened is regulators are reactive to whatever the innovators do. So it's, it's this... Um, <laughs> It's this dynamic where, you know, innovation happens at its own speed and then the regulators try to play catch up and, and then create the policy frameworks around it. And it's why the financial, one of the big reasons to why the financial crisis happened, right? And I think to avoid anything like that from happening in the future, regulators have to take on a very proactive approach. Um, and I think the sandbox the, um, environment, as well as a lot of other initiatives, I think are an attempt to be proactive uh, rather than reactive to um, innovators. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that's why the sandboxes have actually worked so well. It basically allows fintechs and startups to kind of come in, try brand new, uh, 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 brand new ideas and business models, and then regulators can hopefully react to them uh, quickly, right? Look, guys, super, super insightful. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, so we'll just jump into some of the questions in the chat. Uh, There's a question from uh, Shriram, which I will probably pass over to Majid. So do you think that it's time for companies across sectors in the region to also leverage fintech as a growth lever? So if you think about uh, Kareem has some stuff in the fintech space you're doing. Um, uh, STC Pay is also doing quite a stuff, a fair bit of stuff. They actually got a, um, a digital banking license. The way that I kind of see it is that there's all these companies who are almost falling backwards into fintech and realizing, realizing that there's so much value that they can go and capture by maybe offering their customers or their partners a little bit more fintech solutions. But would you, do you think that, you can, let's, let's look, maybe look at Saudi do you think that there is value in more companies and more industries um, going deeper and deeper into, you know, fintech, or do you think they should leave the fintech to the fintech people? Uh, there is no fintech for fintech people. That's the wish <laughs> of fintech people. <laughs> so I always say, you know, it's about opportunity um, that um, that but that uh, cater to you your capability. Um, for instance. Even fintechs, people who want to build a wallet, there is no one wallet in the world that was built because it was a wallet. They were all byproducts. And no one is doing it. Like everyone is like, let's go and build a wallet. And they go and yeah. spend crazy money and then create trash right. and say, oh, we have a wallet. But that wallet yeah. was created because you put a lot of money, not because there was a need for it. You were giving cash back 20% on everything. Yep. and. Yes, I will sign up and I will get all that money and then leave you once you stop that program because I don't need you. That's, that's the sentiment I see when it comes to companies going to build um, uh, fintechs. I'd say, okay, Walmart, I just recently went. Walmart uh, now is uh, creating a huge fintech company. But what does that fintech do? It's a complementary product to what they already have. It's in financing and specifically in a way or another related to what they're offering to their customers. So you cannot, if Walmart decided to build a, a, um, a POS machine or a, or a, or a payment uh, uh, company and go on and, 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 and uh, compete with the, those who are dedicated, well-funded, smart people, they will not win. Actually, they will even not, like competitors will not work with them because of the, the exposure they will get to their, uh, uh, to their data, so it's it's um, it's very. Um, I would say yes. It's a case by case. If you have something that is an added value from you, like a byproduct in a way or another of your of your existing portfolio, then yes, you do it. But just wishing to be a fintech is just saying I want to have a bank. It's just a new way of doing it. It's the old like uh, since I was a kid. Everyone, everyone wants to have a bank now everyone yeah. wants to have a fintech it just doesn't it's work like this yeah, yeah right. you know be, be a fix a problem even for for a company like any yeah. company you can be a fintech and you have the capabilities to build a fintech company i'm not saying no of course yes but i'm saying it has to be a, a complementary 
product to what your suit is. If you're bringing something complement, completely different, then it's it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think also on the point that uh, the other thing if, is if you compare this part of the world to some other parts of the world, here the fintechs you see are normally solving for big things. Everyone's building wallets or banks or this kind of stuff. Whereas in the US and some of the markets, the fintechs are solving for a very narrow uh, problem, right? API, exactly. payroll, or, or like very small things. And still and there are a lot of success behind that. Man, I, I struggle until today to get a corporate credit card. Like a simple, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, like a lot Congrats. of companies, a lot mm-hmm. of companies need this, but no one is yeah. really aggressively investing in this. And uh, why? Because they like the fancy consumer facing kind of products. So yeah. uh, I, I think it's just, you need to fix a problem. That's what you need to do. 100%. All right, uh, Georgina, there's a question for me, but I'm gonna pass it on to you because I think uh, much, much more than me, you've kind of transitioned your career from policy uh, advisor to fintech startup um, entrepreneur. So the question is, uh, how can new talent in the industry upskill, upskill themselves and be part of building the fintech wave in the MENA region? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think I'm asking myself the same question if I'm being completely honest. Um, and especially now that we're in the hiring process, um, you know, when we're looking at talent to bring on, um, I always say, you know, how can we find anyone here with experience to build something that I'm building to solve a specific problem? And, and there's no one that's built it before. When you're building something that no one's done before, you won't have the experience for it. It's very much an experimental process. I think there are a lot of transferable skills, though. And I think every entrepreneur um, you know, has different uh, skills to leverage from their background. And I think any career you take, whether it's in banking or in cybersecurity or in tech or in policy even, which was a very big shift for me, it prepares you in one way or another for the challenges that you will face as a fintech. Because as a fintech, you're dealing with regulations, you're dealing with uh, a little bit of data analytics, uh, you're dealing with obviously the software and, and the tech. Uh, core banking, if you're getting into digital banking, um, there's a lot to navigate, right? So I wouldn't say that one specific thing will ever fully prepare you. And I don't think, to be completely honest, and from the conversations I've had with other entrepreneurs that have built very big and successful companies, um, you don't go in 100% ready ever. You just have to have a growth mindset and uh, have transferable skills and be always open to learn and grow. And it's a very new industry. So if you have experience, if, if you're waiting to build experience, it's going to take about, you know, five, 10 more years because now we have fintechs that will provide you that experience. So you could go work at a fintech um, or you could uh, take a little bit of a Jump crazy. In. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Thank you for that valuable advice. All right. I think we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to give me 30 second answers on this one. We'll just go around the room. Uh, Namira, I'm going to start with you and I'll intentionally leave the question broad. Uh, What is your views on passporting licenses? Is it going to happen? Is it a good idea? It's a good idea. (laughs) Okay. It's a very good idea, Mo. But it, it, hopefully it happens soon. Uh, everyone's working on it. The, 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 the conversations between central banks are happening on a serious note. Um, in the GCC, at least it's happening. And uh, hope, we just hope that it, it, it gets, basically gets uh, implemented soon. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go around my screen. So Ben, you're, you're next. Um, I'd say great idea. Um, I mean, you think about the European perspective, it turns your market as a startup from, you know, a a million, several million to literally hundreds of millions. So in terms of, you know, providing you with the platform to really scale your business, the benefits of passporting are huge. You know, sadly, the UK is now outside of the EU's regime. But if you're licensed in the EU, you've got access to 27 markets. So rather than one. So a yeah. big opportunity if you could introduce something similar in the MENAP region. Yeah. Majid? 
Um, too good to be true. Hopefully it can happen. I'm not really, I wouldn't bet on it, to be honest. Too, like a, I'm optimistic, but uh, also I know the region. It's very tough to happen. I wouldn't build on it. I, you have to be to go to every individual market. You guys may be closer to the regulator. I just think it's tough. Hopefully yeah. it happens. Georgina? Um, I'm going to echo Majid's sentiments as just being a bit realistic. And uh, if I'm speaking as an entrepreneur, amazing. As a former regulator, I think it opens up a lot of questions and risk. And uh, I should probably end it there because it's not in my okay. favor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> very, very important but sensitive topic. All right, uh, we're out of time. Um, there's quite a few people who want to either do partnerships with some of you or to sell things. So um, if you guys just don't mind uh, each of you just uh, letting the audience know how they can contact you, uh, social media, email, Twitter, whatever you prefer. Uh, Namir, do, do you want to just go first? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if there's uh, anyone who would like to get in touch uh, on the association front on to basically engage with more uh, you know, stakeholders in the fintech space in the region, then uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, um, Namir Khan, and you'll see me there. Ben? Link LinkedIn, um, Twitter, I'm on both. Happy to, um, for anyone to be in touch. Majid? Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, you can find me there. Please reach out. And Georgina? Uh, LinkedIn's best form of contact and uh, yeah, happy to be in touch. Great. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining. Thank you for everybody who's watching. Uh, we'll be having the follow-up session, which is going to be uh, on crypto held in about um, a one month time. So we look forward to having you there and have a nice weekend, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.